Well, again, good morning. Welcome to anybody that's tuning in online. Uh, We're glad to have you with us. Looking forward to a day when you might uh, join us here in person and we can meet face-to-face as well. So on May 31st, I finished a month-long running challenge. I was doing a 5K a day in May. It only worked in May because it rhymes that way. And, uh, you know, the a couple of the young men were reminding me, <laughs> telling me a Bible study uh, this week that I use a lot of illustrations with, uh, with running in my sermons. They said, they said every sermon I do, I've got an illustration. I don't know about that. But, you know, it's fitting because we just saw here in Hebrews uh, a couple chapters ago how, how we are, let us run. Let us run this race of faith. And so I, for me, when I run, it, more times than not, um, I'm listening to sermons, and I'm spending time with the Lord, and I'm praying, and there are so many times that I feel that he speaks to me through the imagery of, of running, through the things that I see, through the, the way that my body feels, and, and sometimes I just wish I had a, a notepad while I was running so that I could write these things down. I don't always remember them, but on this particular day here, on May 31st, it was Memorial Day, and I was running in Crivets. We went to, to Crivets for the weekend. And, um, you know, Krivitz is kind of a, it, it's basically like a vacation town. The, the actual population is really small, but uh, people go out there for camping and, and they have their, their kind of vacation homes up there and stuff. And so Memorial Day weekend was, was pretty busy. Now, normally when I run out on the roads in Krivitz, they're pretty barren. Uh, the sun is beating down on me and, uh, and there's no sidewalks, okay? But on um, this Memorial Day weekend, there were a lot of cars, and, uh, and if you know the, the rules for running, um, or for biking for that matter, um, or for, for walking, you know, there's these different rules, you're supposed to run towards the traffic. And there was a lot of traffic on these roads, and like I said, no shoulder, uh, no sidewalk. And it's times like that that I go, man, this seems really counterintuitive. In fact, oftentimes, I'll run and then I'll make sure, I'll check later when I get back, was I supposed to do that? What what are the rules for running? And sure enough, that's that's the rules. You you run towards the traffic. Okay, it seems counterintuitive. It it seems incredibly dangerous. And yet the truth is, is that there's more danger if I were to run on that other side of the road, the way that, that seems like I should, because there is a danger that is unseen. There's the car that's coming from behind me that I wouldn't see. All right, and so I want you to I want you to think of that as we go into this passage today. We're going to talk about something that we are commanded to do as as believers. We we are called to do this, and it at first it seems counterintuitive, and it seems very dangerous. And I want to tell you though, it is dangerous, um, as as running towards oncoming traffic can be dangerous. But there is a greater danger that lies if if we don't respond to this call. And so we're looking today at Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to look at the section of verses 10 through 16. But first, I want to, what I'm talking about is, is, is the theme for today is talking about what it means to be outside the camp, what it means to be outside the camp. And so we're pulling from verse 13 as our main verse. Therefore, let us go to him, Jesus, outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. I want to just kind of briefly go over a couple points I want to make with this in case you know, they're, they're not, they don't all come together here. But, but what I hope you see in this passage is that we go to him, we go to Jesus outside the camp, and as it says in the prior verse, that he went outside of the camp, that we may be sanctified. So the first reason we go outside of the camp is that we may be saved and sanctified through Jesus Christ. We also go outside of the camp, as it says here, bearing a reproach that he endured. We're called to go outside of a camp, and I'll, I'll just call this camp the general camp of comfort. I'll kind of talk about some different things that could symbolize this camp, but, but really it's, it's this camp that we're comfortable in. We're called to go outside of it and, and to bear a reproach like Jesus endured. And thirdly, we're called to go outside to this camp because that's where the mission is. That's where the mission is. Jesus' mission was outside the camp. Our mission is, is outside the camp. So we're going to talk through this term today. But first, I want to, I want to read this uh, passage in its context. So we're going to start on verse 10 and go through 16. Some of this we covered last week as well. But it says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. 
So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let me open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning we would, we would leave here with a greater understanding of what it means to go outside the camp. I see no other place in the New Testament that, that a command is given with these words. And, and outside of the camp is, is, is spelled out throughout the Old Testament. And, and so here it is fitting that we would see it in a book given to, to Hebrew Christians, to those that know their Old Testament well. And, and so, God, I, I pray that we would have a deeper understanding of what this means and how to apply it in our lives today. That we would, um, we would take upon this, this challenge, this call, that we'd be all in to, to be with Christ where he is outside of the camp and to join him on mission. And so I pray, Lord, that this morning you would just um, allow me to, to speak from these scriptures, that these scriptures would, would come alive, that as, as, as they are spoken, Lord, that they would, um, uh, they would, they would do their job in, in communicating to us truth and, and that there is power in these words um, and that there is transformational power, transformation that will happen in and through our lives and, uh, and that as we uh, go through this passage today, Lord, would you, would you set on our heart and on our mind this city of Merrill? Um, would you help us to, to think of those that are outside of, of this camp, outside of these walls um, that we are called to go to and to bring this good news for their salvation and sanctification. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, we look first at, uh, at Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 10, and, uh, and it, it begins to tell us here that um, I think this is a really great summary statement to bring us <laughs> throughout Hebrews of where we're at. So I want to point this out. The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice. Okay? Those words should stand out to you. Holy places, high priest, sacrifice. We've been talking about them all throughout the book of Hebrews. We saw in Hebrews 9, it began to talk about holy places when it said, Even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, that is the one not made with hands, that is not of this creation, Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. There's an earthly holy place. There is the heavenly holy place. Okay, one is better. Okay, that's been the theme throughout. Jesus is better. There's a better holy place. The Jesus that is better goes into the better holy place, right? Jesus is the better high priest we talked about in in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 7 in particular, where it said, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So let us hold fast our confession. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have a better high priest, a high priest that is able to sympathize with us, okay? He's, he's, he's not this far and, and distant priest. Jesus Christ took on flesh that he would be able to suffer the, the temptations and the trials that we did and, and in fact many more that we have a high priest that can sympathize with us. And this high priest, like the high priest of the Old Testament, served as an intercessor. But this one allowed us to come all the way into the holy places, right? This this is the high priest that that can come right right into God's presence because he is a sinless holy priest, high priest. And and we talked about Jesus as a better sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 10, with words like this, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, the ones that can never fully take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, 
Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Okay? New system, instead of sacrifice after sacrifice, the day of atonement that happened every year, the burnt offerings that they offered you know, daily, Jesus offered one sacrifice one once for all, for all time, for all people that would put their trust in, in him as this sacrifice. He did this so that we would be sanctified. Now we're going to get more clarification, I believe, here in Hebrews 13 about the sacrifice and about the holy place and about the high priest. All right, We're going to see all of that in this idea of Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Okay, So again, we have a high priest that entered into the heavenly holy place and offered a better sacrifice on this altar. We have an altar. It's the altar of Calvary, the altar where the, where, where the, of the cross, where the final sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice, and that sacrifice sanctified sinners. So, one thing we learn about this sacrifice here is that it said, a sacrifice for sin burned outside the camp. I talked about this a little bit last week, but I'll give you a passage for this. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 27, gives a description of, of, of the instructions to the priests for the Day of Atonement. And it says that they're the bowl for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burned with fire. All right. So a lot of these sacrifices they were allowed to eat, but they were to take this skin and this flesh and their dung of this sacrifice on the Day of Atonement and put it outside of the camp. Okay. Not only that, but even the burnt offerings that they did, you know, outside of the Day of Atonement, but they offered, I, I believe, daily burnt offerings. The ashes were brought outside of the camp as well. So there's a lot of instruction about outside of the camp throughout the Old Testament. We're, we're going to go through those in a minute. But the first thing I want you to see in Hebrews 13, 12, it said, Jesus, just as the sacrifice for sin on the Day of Atonement was burned outside of the camp, so also Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp. And I want you to see here, he was not sacrificed inside the temple, okay? So, so not only, it's, it's not just Jesus was put outside like the, like the, the flesh and, and the dung of, of these animals that they sacrificed, okay? He wasn't just discarded afterwards. His very sacrifice was made outside of the camp rather than inside of the temple. This, this is a sign of, of how he was, he was rejected by the religious establishment of that day. He was rejected by Judaism. They did not see him as the Messiah. They did not see him as the sacrificial lamb. Okay? And so it was, it was fitting in their mind that he was sacrificed outside of the gate, outside of not only the temple, but outside of the holy city of Jerusalem. This is, this is on the outskirts, a, a literal gate, that, that he was to be outside with the criminals, on a cross, dying a criminal's death. And that's spoken about throughout the Old Testament too. It says in Galatians, referencing back to a passage, I believe in Deuteronomy, that, that said that cursed is, is he who hangs on a tree. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. The reason for that, okay, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the crucifixion that was, that was brought in by, by the Roman government and everything, okay, that was a, really a Gentile practice then. But the idea of, of hanging somebody, putting somebody's dead body on a tree was a way of humiliating them, of, of doing that to your enemies, of showing, showing them, you know, showing their death and making it a public display. And so they, they'd be considered cursed to have that kind of exploitation. So cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree, and Jesus fulfills that. He takes on the curse, not of his sin, the curse of our sin, he bears on that cross. So he is, he is in that sense cursed. He bears the curse of mankind on the cross in order that we might be sanctified. He suffered in that way, as it says here, that we might be sanctified through his own blood. Um, in thinking about outside of the camp, too, I want to point out that uh, a lot of the rules for what, what, what the unclean things that go outside of the camp, the reason for that primarily 
is that God was inside of the camp. And so there needed to be this, this separation. There needed to be a separation from the holy and the profane, the clean, the unclean, because God was in the camp. This isn't the first time here that God goes outside of the camp either. It, there, there's so many things you see in the Old Testament. Sometimes we think Old Testament does things one way, and then New Testament comes and flips the script entirely. But there are always these little hints that happen in the Old Testament too. That at least one time that God is outside of the camp is after uh, he's, he's traveling with them out of Egypt, with Moses and the Israelites. And he guides them by a, by a cloud by, by day and, and fire by night. Okay, And then there's a moment that Moses goes up and he receives the Ten Commandments. And what happens when Moses comes down? But he sees these people that while they were waiting for Moses to bring them the commands from God, sacrificing to an idol. They built for themselves this golden calf and they're doing all types of debauchery. And Moses is upset and obviously God is even more upset. And after that incident, God withdraws himself from the camp. He withdraws himself from the camp and he starts to give instructions for Moses that says, from now on, I want you, Moses, to come out and meet me in this tent, to take a tent with you, to put it outside of the camp and to meet with me in that tent. And it says uh, of that tent as well um, that uh, Exodus 33, 7 is where this is recorded. And it says, um, Moses used to take this tent and pitch it outside the camp far off from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of the meeting, which was outside of the camp. And so again, I tell you, my, my, my first point here is that we go outside of the camp to see where, that's where Jesus is and to be sanctified by Jesus. Okay? We, we, we step outside of kind of the religious institutions and, and encounter Jesus in relationship, okay? It's, it's not through ritual that we are made right with God. It is through that relationship with Jesus Christ that we are made right with God. You know, later in the Old Testament, Solomon builds the temple, and this temple when we read about it in the scriptures, it's, it's really not just a place where people came together. It's not just a place where people came together to worship, but this is where priests and religious leaders, they were given the highest honor and authority among the Israelites. And it was these individuals that would intercede on their behalf to God, and it was the temple and then this priestly system that they, the Israelites, ended up viewing as the place The holy temple is the place and these priests as the persons where their salvation was found. They began to put their faith in the temple, in the building, and in these priests, in in, in these persons. Jesus reorients this view of worship salvation from a place and priests to one person, himself. Consider before his crucifixion when, when Pilate brings him before the people. And these words, Pilate doesn't even understand how profound they are. But do you remember what he says as he pres- presents Jesus to the people? He says, behold the man. Behold the man. Behold the man, this, this Jesus who you, who you offered up to be imprisoned and to be beaten, and then eventually they cry out for him to be crucified. But Pilate has this conversation, he finds no fault in him, and he says, behold, behold the man, this is him, with the crown of thorns on. Has, you know, kind of trying to display, has he not been beaten enough? Do, do you not see that, that, you know, mercy should be granted on this man? But I just look at those words, I say, behold the man, behold the lamb, behold salvation. That's, that's the declaration that, that Pilate, unbeknowing, is saying there. Behold the man. We are a New Testament church. We are a New Testament church. Salvation is found in Christ alone, through faith alone. And so, if you come to church on Sundays and you're thinking that your actions of of merely coming into the building or of of reading the Bible, that that it's these these actions, these works, um, are, are what saves you, are what moves you from the naughty list to the nice list, uh, you, you are mistaken. It is by grace 
with which you are saved and not by works. We come here on Sunday mornings. What we do here, we don't come into this place as if it was the Old Testament Israelite holy temple thinking that it's here that salvation is found. Or that it's through the pastor that if he might forgive me of my sins, if we might do a time of confessional here, that salvation is found. That's, that's not what's going on here. We come into this place to worship. We come into this place to do as it says in Hebrews 13, 15, and 16. That's why this comes after the understanding that Jesus Christ went outside of the camp for our sanctification. So then through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Do not flip that. Don't consider that we, we worship in, in word and in deed in order to gain our salvation. Salvation has come because Jesus went outside of the camp for our sanctification. And that as a result then, then through him, through Jesus Christ, let us offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. All right? We also saw these same kind of instructions throughout Hebrews. Hebrews 12 and Hebrews 10. It said, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Or in Hebrews chapter 10, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Much like we see here, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Let us not neglect meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We do those things because of what Christ has accomplished for us. So again, we go outside the camp to him to be sanctified. Jesus went outside of the camp bearing his own, his own cross. He suffered outside of the camp, not only in death, but he also suffered the reproach and rejection of men as it was prophesied. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6, is one of those prophecies. You're probably familiar with this one. That Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus on the cross and throughout his life was, was persecuted and mocked and rejected and suffered the reproach and the rejection of men. So to better understand the reproach that we take upon ourselves when we follow this call to go outside of the camp, as I already alluded, there's a lot of passages throughout the Old Testament about what went outside of the camp and what characterized outside of the camp. So I want to read you at least three of those from Leviticus. Uh, <clears throat> David Platt describes through these three passages that outside of the camp meant it was dirty, it was dangerous, and it was a place where things were despised. Dirty, dangerous, and despised. Leviticus 16, 27 through 28, we read 27 that this, this, this sin offering went outside of the camp, the, the flesh of the bull and the goat. And then the person, the individual, the priest that brought those out, he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. The reason he would need to wash his clothes and bathe his body is that outside of the camp was considered a dirty place. That's a dirty place. It's a place of, of uncleanliness. So he needed to cleanse himself before he could come back inside of the camp. Leviticus 24, 10 through 16 tells the, the situation of an Israelite woman's son. It says, whose father was an Egyptian, he went out among the people of Israel, and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp, and the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. 
Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. They put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, here's the, here's the Lord's instruction for the man who would blaspheme him. Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death, and the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. So this is a place of punishment. It's a place where your life would be at risk. You could be stoned if you were instructed to go outside of the camp for your sin. And lastly, a place where you would be despised. Leviticus 13, 45 through 46 Leviticus 13 and 14 give all these instructions about, about leprosy, about a skin disease. Okay? Basically, uh, throughout uh, the Old Testament, it explains that uh, you know, if you've got some kind of oozing happening on your skin, if you've got kind of any fluid that's coming outside of the body, okay, this is blood and, and other things, there were instructions about going outside of the camp and being there for seven days. Okay? This, in, this included women having to do this monthly, being outside of the camp for seven days. After birth, they had to go outside of the camp for seven days, 14 days if it was a girl, and then there was an extra 33 or 66 days of, of a cleansing ritual that they had to go through. Okay, So you think it's bad enough having to stay in the hospital for a couple of days after birth. Imagine having to go outside of the camp, being out in a tent in the wilderness, being away from people. <laughs> Some people are thinking, hey, it might not be too bad. I could use a little alone time, all right? You probably get to leave the baby behind and just, just go and, and, and have a little time off. But, but outside, being excluded, being abandoned, you felt despised. And such is the case for the leprous person as well. Who, the leprous person who has this disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean instructed to let everybody know, stay away from me. I'm an unclean, dirty person. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Okay? When you read that, you, you understand as you read the New Testament, when you read the Gospels, how, how people just stayed away from the leprous person because that continued to be in place. So we, we go outside of the camp to bear the reproach that Jesus endured. To go in, in, in places that might be dirty, dangerous, despised. Um, we, we, we become part of that identity of, of being outside of the camp, as Jesus was. There's, there's reproach that comes along with that. Uh, Psalm 69, verses 7 through 12, um, tells of, of David crying out about his reproach, where he says, it is for your sake, Lord, that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. Okay? This kind of reproach happens even amongst kinship, even amongst family, flesh and blood. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate, and the drunkards make songs about me. Part of this reproach would be the, the ill will that people will speak of you to follow after Christ, to be mocked and rejected. They'll make songs about you. Further on in 19 through 21, the psalmist says, you know my reproach, my shame, my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. That's, that's what we're called to as believers. Some of you are thinking this doesn't sound like good news. We get to that in the following verses that explains that, that this world is not our own. This is not our city. This is, there's something greater for us. We've seen that instruction throughout Hebrews. So let me, let me tell you kind of practically here, what does it mean for us to go 
outside the camp. To go outside the camp. Well, we go outside the city, okay? We go outside the, the world. We, we live separately, okay? In the same way that, that, that there, there was a distinction between cleanliness and uncleanliness, we, we, we do still have some of that distinction as it was in the Old Testament. We, as believers in Christ, are to live upright and, and, and righteous lives. We're, we're to live differently, okay? Think about John 15, verses 18 through 21, where it says that we're in the world, but not of it. It says, um, it says, if the world hates you, know it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus Christ, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. Okay? If Jesus suffered reproach, then those that would be imitators of Jesus, those that would be followers of Christ, should expect that type of reproach. He spelled it out in, in, in some of his last words to the disciples before, um, before he left, before he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended. Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16, we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This is not just talking about marriage, okay? This is talking that, that, that we should not be yoked. We should not be so intimately tied. I'll say that, okay? This is not instructing, as I'll, I'll point out later, to have no contact with the unbeliever. But do not be yoked with them. Do not be intimately yoked with somebody, whether it's a, it's a, it's a friendship or a dating relationship or, or a marriage. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Bial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So in going outside of the camp, we are to live separately. Okay, We are to be distinct. Our, our actions ought to show that we're different. That's where the reproach comes in. When you do that, it's not, it's not cool to be different from the world. That's, that's where there will be um, a great amount of reproach. Um, and I say this too because... Um, sorry. We also go outside the camp, though, to join Jesus on his mission for salvation. So this is in the world not of the world. This is the in the world part of it. You're not to be of the world. You are supposed to live separately. But this instruction for going outside of the camp, not only do we, do we commit ourselves to Jesus, but we commit ourselves to the mission that, that Jesus lived out. Okay? Jesus was, was the individual that, that did uh, go to the, the hemorrhaging woman. Remember? He, he's the one that touched the lepers. When everybody was... A, I think about the, the, the Chosen has given me so much imagery, that, that, that TV series. And I think about how in a recent episode, a, a leprous man comes towards Jesus and, and, and the disciples go, no, no, we got to protect Jesus from the leprous man. But Jesus says, no, I, I got this. <laughs> and he, and he, he touches, he touches the leprous man. Would have been mind-blowing for people to see that. But, but, but Jesus is greater than this leprosy. Okay? Jesus is, 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 is greater than this, this man's um, illness. And so, so Jesus, Jesus not only went to, to this hemorrhaging woman, to, to lepers, but to tax collectors. It's in, it's in Luke chapter 5 where he calls Matthew uh, the tax collector, and he goes to his house and he dines with him, and it's, it's in that context that we have the Bible verse that Jesus says that the well don't need a physician. The healthy don't need a physician. It's the sick. I've come to heal the sick. I've come not to the righteous, but to the sinners. And then later in Luke chapter 18, I think it is, he calls Zacchaeus. 
that wee little man. He calls Zacchaeus, and I think he, he again has dinner with him as well, and it's in that passage that, that we get what I describe as Jesus' mission statement. I have come to seek and to save the lost. I have come to seek and to save the lost. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to go outside of the camp, and, and we're going to be in the places that he was, in the dirty, dangerous, and defiled places, and, and we're going to live out the mission there with him. In those same passages in, in the book of John and in 2 Corinthians, okay, where I just told you we're not to be of the world. Listen to how we are still in the world, though. John 17, 14 through 19 says, I've given them your word, the believers your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I just ask that you protect them from the evil one, that they might not become like the world. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, okay, in this same passage where we read, do not be unequally yoked with the unbeliever, you got to read the context around all that. There's like this small passage about not being unequally yoked with the, with the unbeliever. There's a lot of context about the ministry of reconciliation, okay, about being ambassadors for Christ. And listen to this. In a favorable time I listened to you, in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, Paul says so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. It's one set of lists, okay? That's the reproach. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, that's what we're provided with. A lot of fruits of the Spirit kind of language in there, right? Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. That's a list right there. <laughs> that is a list. And that's not just Paul talking about him and his companions. He's giving this instruction. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul's saying, I'm doing my best. This is the kind of list that I think Jesus Christ himself experienced in his ministry, that we then are called as apostles of Christ to do that. And I'm telling you, Corinthians, as well, that this is the life that you're called to live as well. This is the life that you're called to live. Study this list. Understand that that there's honor and dishonor, slander and praise. You treat it as imposters, yet you're true. You've got the word of God. Unknown yet well-known. Okay? The world will not recognize these things, but, but God your Father will. And we rejoice greatly in that. I've heard it said that the church... It's not a cruise ship. It's an aircraft carrier. Okay? We gather together on Sunday mornings. It's, it's, it's not to be comfortable. It's not to find our place and to just sit still and then to beckon others to come to us and to join us. Okay? It's an aircraft carrier. In the way that the aircraft carrier comes into the ship so that it can refuel and then it goes back out on its mission. All right? So what, that's what we want to experience when we come together here is a, is a refueling, and an, an, an encouragement that we're with brothers and sisters in Christ and that we hear from the word of God week in and week out every Sunday that it would prepare us for how we are to live outside of these four walls. Again, we don't, we don't come here for salvation. Salvation is found in, in, in what we preach. We point others towards salvation week in and week out here in a Sunday service. Salvation is found in Jesus Christ and he's outside of the camp. Okay? 
And then we join him outside of the camp on mission. And so we, 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 we need to remember that, that the mission is out there. The mission is out there. How are we, downtown Mission Church here in Merrill, looking to be on mission? Well, starting with this summer, as I said through the announcements today, we're looking to, to do what we do here in the public eye on Sunday mornings through worshiping in the park three times. We have three opportunities here to, to, to be outside in the public eye and, and worship. We're, 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 we're praying and singing songs to the Lord out here at the Agri Pavilion this, this Thursday and hopefully a couple more times as well that, that people might, might see what we're doing, that we might have opportunity to invite people to join us. Maybe some people are scared of these four walls, okay? <laughs> they, they, they don't want to walk in here and so we can go out to where they are and invite them to join us there. We, we saw some pretty incredible things when we did this in Wausau, watching people just going for a walk and, and stopping and joining us and, and just listening, just hearing our songs and, and having conversation with people. We hope to do that again. To this, uh, the, the, this koinonia group that we're bringing in, like I said, the gospel message is going to be uh, declared through musical drama, okay? Something different than what we do on Sunday. We sing these songs and we, we read from the word, but they're, they're going to use theater, uh, to share the gospel message, and we, we want to join them on their mission to do that. And so we've invited them to come here to Merrill, and we want to invite people to, to, to see that means of the gospel being expressed through, through their th- musical drama. But outside of that, too, we're, we're, we're praying and we're open to more ideas. Mostly, want to equip you all as, as individuals to, to each one reach one, okay? To be part of the disciple-making commission that was given to us, whether that's to an unbeliever or to a believer, to help them either um, you know, through evangelism or edification, either to bring an individual for the first time into a relationship with the Lord or to help them mature and grow in that relationship with the Lord. Okay? Much of that happens outside of this camp. Okay? It happens outside of the Sunday morning experience as well. And so... We hope that when you're here on Sunday mornings, it's it's equipping you for that daily living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in your everyday lives, in your workplaces, and in your neighborhoods. And we pray. We pray to that end. Um, I've talked about us uh, finding an opportunity to serve our community through through a workday this summer, to take a Sunday morning and, again, go outside of the walls here and to serve our community, whether it's uh, cutting grass for somebody that can't get, get around to it or uh, whatever it is, doing some gardening, uh, something that, uh, that's good for being outdoors, painting a house maybe. Um, so it, consider and pray about ways that we can, we can serve the community, that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in, in service, and then also um, you know, sharing the gospel message as we have opportunity as well too, so that we're doing it in both word and he. So the passage closes with this, that uh, as if going outside of the camp because Jesus did it and we're to be followers of Christ, if that's not motivation and encouragement enough, it's because we have no lasting city. We seek the city that is to come. Okay? This has been brought up throughout Hebrews. Okay, that there's, there's always something better. Hebrews chapter 10, 34 said that these people once joyfully accepted the plundering of their possessions. Why? Because they have better possessions. Because these, these earthly things are temporal. Moses chose to be mistreated rather than to, to, be, to be wealthy in the Egyptian community. He chose mistreatment. He left his, his Egyptian heritage that he had to pursue his Israelite heritage with the Lord because there's a better wealth that's available to him. Christ endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. There's a greater joy that exists for us. We just read at the beginning of Hebrews 13 that we, need, we should free ourselves from the love of money. We should find ourselves in a place of contentment because, as it said, the Lord is my helper. The Lord provides for me. I'm content in the Lord. And so lastly, our response here, it says in Hebrews, as I already pointed out earlier too, is that we, um, we, offer, we offer sacrifices, the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips are a sacrifice to the Lord. Um, and and, and we, 
we have good deeds. Okay, so it's in word and deed that, that is our, our offering of sacrifice. Psalm 69, which we'd read earlier about the psalmist talking about his reproach. I want to close out with his words. Psalm 69 said then here at the end, um, it says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. We may go outside of the camp, and we may find ourselves in a place of reproach. As we're living out the life that God has called us to, holy, righteous, set-apart lives, that the, wor- that the world will not acknowledge and approve. <laughs> and as we live out the mission of Jesus as well, to try and minister to the very ones <laughs> that will not approve of our actions. We, we, we continue to take that reproach on mission for Jesus. And while we do so, we, we continuously offer up a sacrifice of praise to God in, in word and in deed. So I'm going to pray for us, and, and John's going to come up and lead us in two songs so that we can, we can continue to put into this practice of, of, of the praise of our lips unto God. Heavenly Father, it is not an easy task to be called to go outside of this camp, to bear reproach, and to be a witness to others of this good news. We think of of how hard it was for this Hebrew audience, these Hebrew Christians, to, to hear this understanding that you did not want to be outside of the camp when you were in the Old Testament. But Jesus... Jesus, in going outside of the camp, takes what was, what was defiled, unclean, and makes it clean, makes it holy. So we go outside of the camp to where Jesus is, and he makes us holy. He makes us clean, and he puts us on mission to help others to experience that same, that same wholeness, that same cleanliness. He washes our sins white as snow. And we praise you, God, for that. We praise you for that with the fruit of our lips and we praise you for that with the work of our hands. God, give us strength. Give us encouragement from your word, from one another speaking this word to one another. Help us to come into this place each week and and be encouraged and be strengthened for the work that happens outside of these four walls. I pray this... In Jesus' name.